Hello everyone, uh, welcome to what is our first time pre-recording Aetanos lectures. Um, so it's a new, bit of an innovative time for us um, and everything's a bit different. So um, my name's Josh and welcome. You're here for the Chemistry 3-4 Unit 3 sort of Head Start revision lecture. We're going to go through a bit of stuff that some of you will have already been through, some of you won't have, and then we're going to go through some other stuff that I think probably none of you or very few of you will have been through. So a bit of both revision head start, but we're mainly going to be looking at equilibria and electrochem today. So a bit of redox. Um, we're not going to touch on fuels. We did that at the start of the year um, in a lot of detail. It was over about, it would have been about an hour and a half. I ran that lecture of fuels. So we're not going to run through that today. If you really want to go through that stuff, I recommend going to the ATAR nodes website, going to our pre-recorded lectures um, and going back to the, uh, January lecture series, um, and you'll find it there. Um, but nonetheless, welcome. So, um, as you can see, um, I'm representing ATAR notes today, um, and I have been for quite a while, but uh, haven't been representing them as long as they've been around. They've been around for a very long time, since about 2007. Um, I'm sure a little bit scary, but some of you would have only been two or three or four around then. Um, but essentially, They've been providing free resources for students for a very, very long time. So we have the free lectures. Um, we also have things such as, oh, let me uh, get my finger. There you go. My finger's now working on the screen. Um, they have things such as like study notes, lectures, discussion spaces, and they have obviously the videos and stuff like what we're doing today. There's newsletters and articles. And I think things like the Q&A, the discussions, the forums, that's where you're going to get your best information is where you're going to go and you're going to get what you want. Um, you can ask questions. There are tutors on there. There are other experts on there. There are students who know what they're doing on there. Um, so it's a really good opportunity to sort of, um, it's a really good space um, to get the information that you need um, when you need it. So that's been around for a very, very long time and it's just continued to grow and grow and grow. So being year 12 and being, for those of you who are in year 11 doing this, this is an opportunity for you to also get out there and have a go at this stuff. So just to continue on, um, there are also more resources that are paid for. Um, and so we have things such as like the study guides. I'm sure you've all seen them before. You can now access those study guides online via Ed Unlimited. Um, these things we have promos for at the moment. Um, you'll see them in your sort of portal page where you're viewing this recording. Um, I'm not going to go through them personally in the recording. You'll see them there. Um, if you have any questions, please ask because saying hi to future me, future me will be in the chat right now, um, discussing and answering any questions you have uh, around chemistry and all these sort of things. Um, and we also have Tutesmart, which is who I work for. Um, and they're essentially just a tutoring company. Um, and it's who I've been with for four and a half, five years now. Um, and that's essentially the extra resources that we now provide. So just to give a bit of context and structure to today, we're going to spend about 55 minutes on each. I've given 55 minutes because it gives about 10 minutes leeway for like things like this, the intro, um, any excess time that we may spend on them. So just letting you know this lecture will run two hours, but I've just sort of allocated those times just to give a little bit of leeway in case we run a bit over on one of the two topics. Um, there's not going to be any breaks in the middle. So for, so for the, those of you watching the live recording, uh, sort of the, the live opening of the recording, a bit of a odd thing to say, um, but it'll be the the premiere of it in a way, um, this will run all the way through. Um, and so you'll be, I'll be in the chat and I'll be able to answer any questions. So as you're watching the recording afterwards, you're welcome to pause it at any point in time. There will be times where I will say, feel free to pause it if you're watching the recording um, and have a go at this, etc. Whereas I won't be sort of pausing in those times. I'll just be going through. Um, but that is essentially today. That is what we're going to do. Rates and equilibria and then electrochem. It's going to be a big overview of the two topics because I know that some of you will have started them, some of you will have done parts of them, and then some of you won't have done any of it. So it'll be a bit of head star revision in the middle. And um, then a little bit about who I am. So obviously my name's Josh. Um, I've been at ATAR Notes for a very long time. I've been running these lectures for about three or four years now. Um, I, back in the day, 2018, I graduated with the 98.23. Got the exact numbers now. But I had a 44 in chem, and as we all know, chem scales up quite nicely. So I scaled up around a 48, I think. Um, and I'm now studying medicine at Monash. I'm an undergrad. I've finished four years of my degree. I'm now sort of interiming. I'm doing a research year or an honours year. 
um, at the Victorian Heart Hospital on Monash campus, which is nice. Um, and that's a bit about who I am. So next year I have my fifth year and then I am essentially a doctor. Uh, other things about me, I have a dog. Um, I'm from Bendigo, so I have a dog back in Bendigo, which I adore. Um, her name is Maya. Um, and I also have a cat that is quite a chubby little cat. Um, she's an elder of the community. I think she's pushing on 14 this year. Um, so, you know, she can eat and not do anything because she's earned it. Um, and then a little bit of context for what I'm doing this year. I'm doing some research and at the moment I'm doing what we call a literature review, which is where you just read lots and lots and lots of really detailed, hard to read journal articles. Um, and so this might cause some of you a little bit of pain, I think, actually. Um, for me, I am quite organized, but my tabs at the moment look a little bit like this. Um, and so it might hurt a few of you to see some tabs that are a bit of a mess. Um, and that's just my work tabs, my, uh, my uni tabs. I have another thing for work and I have another thing for personal. So I've got like four of these pages that are all this big, um, which I had to close, otherwise my laptop would have died running this lecture. So that might hurt some of you to see that, um, but that is what my tabs look like at the moment. So essentially, lecture overview. We're gonna be running through electrochem. These are the points we're gonna sort of touch on. We're also gonna be running through equilibria. It's actually gonna be in reverse. I've reversed it partly because as much as electrochem sort of does come up first, it kind of doesn't. You'll find that on the back of fuels, you do a little bit of redox and then you kind of don't do electrochem. You don't do electrolysis. That ends up happening at the end after equilibria. So what I've done is I've just pulled all of redox and put it all together after equilibrium. So the arrow should actually really be going that way. Um, and as you can see down here, you can see exactly what we're gonna do, when we're gonna do it, etc. So let's start block one. Let's jump in, rates and equilibria. So I think what's really, really important is to understand that rates and equilibria is essentially, all it is is about um, how do we reach an equilibrium? How do we reach like a homeostasis? So in the body and equilibrium is what we refer to as homeostasis. Um, so you might know it as sort of body temperature. Our body loves to sit at a very comfortable 37.5 something. Um, that is homeostasis. Our body likes that equilibrium. When we run, we get hot, we sweat. That sweat allows sort of air to cool our skin down and cool us down, things like that. Um, when we get really cold, we shiver and the shivering makes the muscles move and the muscles end up heating up the inside of the body. So same sort of thing. We'd love to stay at that constant, you know, 37 degrees, and that equilibrium is all coming from um, sort of homeostasis. So in chemistry, we refer to that as equilibriums. We're also gonna talk about rates as well as a part of that. So I like to break the topic up, and these are the two things I like to break it into. So I like to break it into um, reaction rates, and I like to break it into equilibrium or equilibrii. So I think I spelled equilibrium wrong there, but nonetheless, we have Reaction rates, which is essentially how quick something occurs and why does it occur? So why is a reaction occurring? Why is it occurring at this pace? So think about why does it occur? Why does it occur at this rate? Um, that is all we talk about with reaction rates. And then how do we manipulate that? Then equilibriums is a little bit different. Equilibriums is where we talk about irreversible versus reversible. Um, we talk about sort of dynamic equilibriums. Like why does the equilibrium, why do the reactions keep occurring but nothing looks like it's happening? Um, quantifying and then calculation. So Reaction rates is very um, qualitative information. So it's very like, you know, discussing words, writing down, equilibriums. There's a little bit of qualitative, but it's mainly quantitative. You're mainly gonna be looking at numbers, manipulation, calculations. For those who are more maths based, you're gonna enjoy that so much more. So let's start with collision theory. I'm just gonna take my charger on my laptop. Um, why my laptop will die in about half an hour. So, Let's start with collision theory and let's talk about why things happen. So chemical reactions are a result of collisions between molecules. So it's essentially like two things collide. So probably gonna use it's a bit of a sinister example, but I'm just thinking about it at the time. Think about something like football. Um, so think about you only get an injury most of the time when two things collide, two players collide, you get players bumping into each other, you get collision, you get an injury. That is sort of, you've got your reaction, they collide, then you get your product, which is the injury. Um, however, it says here, not all collisions result in a reaction. So not all collisions in football result in an injury. Think of it like that. 
So collisions that result in reactions are successful, or what we refer to as fruitful, which is just a very fancy word for successful. Um, two main aspects that determine whether collision is successful is whether there was sufficient energy and whether they were in the correct orientation. So they had two really key facts. So let's go over sort of sufficient energy first. So sufficient energy looks at our activation energy. Now you will have seen one of these diagrams before. These are our energy, energy diagrams. They look at a reaction. Remember that this here would be exothermic. And so what you can see is that, oh, oops, I did not mean to get rid of that. Let me get that back up. What you can see here is that when we look at this here, we have this arrow going from here to here. This here is your activation energy. This is the amount of energy. So let's just say for theory's sake, and this is not going to be anywhere near correct, but we'll say, you know, this is 50 kilojoules, and then this is like, you know, 120 kilojoules. You would need 70 kilojoules of energy just to make this reaction occur. Then you would produce from here to here, let's just say this was down to 20 kilojoules, you would then go and produce 100 kilojoules of energy. But what is your net? Your net would be because the 70 that you used is then cancelling out 70 of what you make, your net would then be your 30 kilojoules down here. But it's positive because, oh, well, technically it's negative actually. It's negative because it's leaving the system, the energy here. So this energy is what we refer to as negative. It's not actually negative energy. It's just the direction of it. It's leaving the system. So by this energy being negative and leaving the system, what do we then say? Well, it's exothermic because the energy is gone from the system. So this would be an exothermic. Now, this is what we refer to as sufficient energy is this part here. This is your activation energy or E to the little a. Um, that is activation energy. You're welcome to use E to the little a in exams and in SACs. That's how we refer to it as activation energy. Um, if you are writing like a three or four mark question, I would say in brackets, E to the little a equals you know, activation da, 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 energy, da, 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 and then, you know, then from there I'll use E to the a. Just sort of giving context to the examiner. So as you can see here, we've got a reaction energy profile on either side, reactions products, top of the hill is transition state. Um, it can be described as an activation barrier. So it's like a barrier and if you don't hit it hard enough, you're not gonna get a reaction. Um, and energy needed to go from ground state to transition state is essentially what we're looking at. Um, the energy of the collision has to be greater than the activation energy for it to occur. So if it's still not making sense, made it like Legos, imagine Lego bricks are like atoms making up molecules. Um, you get that, you get to that. And it's saying, hey, what do I need to get from this to this? I need to add some energy in here. So in this case here, this would be like an endothermic reaction. If we're going the other way, um, it would be like an exothermic. So this is the added activation energy and it actually ends up being sort of added in because remember with these profiles, it ends up like this. This part of it is what ends up getting added in. Whereas these bricks here may have maybe the leftovers. So um, collisions must occur uh, with correct orientation. I'm much rather my football example than Lego example, by the way. So this is a very intricate part of this um, and it's very detailed and you'll find that um, this doesn't come up all that often and there is a reason this doesn't come up all that often and that reason is that these orientations as such, um, these orientations as such are quite complicated and so we simplify it right down. We simplify it all the way down to just looking at sort of like, is it hitting on the right side? If it is, we're going to get it. If not, don't worry about it. Um, there is far more detail to this, but it's not at VCE level. So, as you can see here, we want to add in an OH or like a hydroxide group. Uh, and we want to remove that bromide or bromine. Um, as you can see here, we cannot get rid of it if we hit from this side because we need to knock this off. So, by doing so, what you need to actually do is, well, this side would actually work. So, essentially, you're going to hit it on here and it's going to knock it off the other way. If you hit it directly, it's not actually going to work. Um, so essentially what you need to do is knock it from the other side, you need to hit it away, and then it works. If you hit it on the same side, it's not going to work. Now, when I said there, I said, oh, well, we need to hit it directly. Some cases it's hitting it directly, some cases it isn't. That's why that sort of detail you're never going to get asked. You're not going to ask that in a SAT, you're not going to ask that in an exam, you're not going to be asked, oh, did it hit it in this exact spot? All you need to do is just discuss, hey, it just needs to hit it in the correct orientation. That is it. That's all you need to know. You don't really need to know anything more than that. You don't need to know exact examples. You don't need to know exactly where it needs to hit. 
you just need to know, hey, it needs to hit in the correct orientation. So that should simplify that sort of concept right down. So to reiterate, the main aspects to determine whether the collision is successful is correct orientation and sufficient amount of energy. They are the two really big things. You need to make sure you have those two things in order for it to occur. So collisions must be sufficiently energetic or have sufficient energy and they must be in the correct orientation. Cool. So then we say, how do we make things go faster? Because we don't like things going slow. We want things to go fast. So there are two fundamental ways of increasing reaction. These two fundamental ways are increase the collision frequency and increase the proportion of successful collisions. So let's talk about collision frequency first and then we'll go into successful collisions. So increasing collision frequency. So let's think about this logically. If you have a reaction and you want the reaction to occur, for the reaction to occur, we discuss that things need to collide and they need to collide with sufficient energy in the right orientation. But the first rule in that essentially was they need to collide. If things don't collide, nothing happens. So we need things to collide more often. So let's think about ways we can make things collide more often. So let's just think about you've got air particles in a balloon and you want them to react and you know, create something else. And those air particles within that balloon are bouncing around. Because remember that we talked about our gas theory that we already talked about. Gases move in straight lines. So they'll go like bang, 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 bang. You know, that wasn't a straight line, but you know what I mean. Uh, maybe it hit something there. Let's just say it hit something there and then went that way. Uh, but essentially, things go in straight lines. Let's go back to red. So things go in straight lines. And for things to continue, sort of, they continue bouncing around within a space. So let's think about that balloon and think about those air particles and things are bouncing around in that space. So when things are bouncing around in that space, we want them to bump into each other more. We can't really manipulate how they're bouncing around, but we want them to knock into each other more. So how do we do that? Think about a couple of logical things. What can we do? We can speed up how quickly they're moving because the quicker they're moving, the more likely they are to bump into each other because you know, if they're following a set path and they're gonna bump a certain amount of times, if it's really slow, then the reaction rate is slow. But if you make those particles move around quicker, they're gonna bump into each other more. So let's speed up those particles. What's a way of speeding up particles? Heat something up. So first thing, increase the temperature. The higher the temperature, the faster we move things, the higher the collision frequency, the more fruitful collisions we get because we're gonna get more collisions and even if the proportion isn't any better, you're still gonna get more collisions because overall you're gonna get more fruitful collisions because overall you've got more collisions. Then we think about a second one. Um, I like to think of this as taking a metro train. So if you take a metro train at 11 o'clock at night, what's the likelihood you're going to rub shoulders with someone else? Pretty unlikely. You're probably even you're gonna get a seat, you're gonna sit down, you're probably gonna have even one of those four spaces to yourself. Um, you're not gonna be you're not going to have any issues getting a seat or rubbing into anyone. But let's say you take it at either like you know, four o'clock or maybe even after a footy match. Um, what's going to happen? You're going to be squished up together and you're going to bump into each other all the time. You're bumping into people as you get on. You know, you're going to be rubbing up against shoulders against people as you walk off and as you're standing there waiting for the train to get to your stop. That, if we think about it, is the same thing with particles we push more particles into that balloon, what's gonna happen? You're gonna get more collisions. So, what are, how, how do we word that chemistry-wise? We increase the concentration. So, increase the concentration or the pressure. So, pressure for gases, concentration for solutes. Um, so, that's like aqueous solutions. Um, and as you can see here, more particles, more collisions, etc. And then, what's our sort of third one here? And this third one's a bit of an interesting one because it kind of talks about solids. Um, or if we've got something bumping up against the solid for a reaction to occur, this is surface area. So one that comes up far less often, but if you've got more surface area on a solid, maybe that's the catalyst solid, or maybe it's part of the reaction in the solid, um, you need to have more surface area for things to bump into. So that is essentially our third option there. So we have three options there. The first two are the main two, that third one's sort of just an extra one, but you do need to know it. So, um, increase the proportion of successful collisions. So, we need to sort of give context to this as well. Let's just say overall we have, why does that keep zooming in? Stop zooming in. 
we have 50 collisions. That's how many we have. So we count the number of collisions between some particles in a balloon, or, you know, like a one minute period or 30 second period. You get 50 collisions. However, you only get products out of those collisions on maybe 20 of those occasions. Therefore, what you're operating at is a 40% collision rate. Now, what if we did something to increase those proportion of successful collisions? So what we would do is we keep this number the same. This number stays the same, but this number increases. And let's just say we went to a 35. So instead of having 40%, you're actually looking at more like 70% now. So you get far more successful collisions. You get more of the product that you want or whatever is gonna come out of it. So what are the two ways that we can do this? First way is, and I wanna draw out this again, is to look at this. We're gonna look at this in both examples actually. This is our activation energy. Activation energy. So we have our activation energy here. Let's just say that 20 of those collisions could do this or greater. The other 20 collisions did this. The other 30 collisions did this. So they didn't have the activation energy. They got somewhat there, but they didn't get there enough. So then they just dropped. So what if we increase the temperature of everything that's in our balloon? Well, if we increase the temperature of everything that's in our balloon, we're going to increase the kinetic energy. And by increasing the kinetic energy, these ones are now going to be all the way up here, even though they don't need to be. And these ones are now going to be more up here. And some of them may still go there, but some of them may go just high enough to go there. So now what you've done is you've increased the number of particles that can actually go through what we're talking about. We can go through the collision um, and we can successfully get a product. So increasing the proportion of successful collisions, what we do is we increase the, uh, the temperature. By increasing the temperature, the particles move faster. They have more energy. So in the last one, we said, hey, they have particles move faster. You have a high collision frequency. In this one, we talk about how they have more energy. By having more energy, they can overcome that activation energy better. So then the key point is increasing temperature affects both it affects the rate in both ways. So it's the only one that will increase it in both ways, which is why it's the best way of increasing rate is to increase temperature because it has a twofold effect. It affects one and it affects the other, both parts. So higher temp, higher collision frequency. Then we have method two, which is where we increase the proportion of successful collisions. And how we do that is we use a catalyst. So the first one was increasing the proportion via sort of just increasing everything. This one is by not increasing the energy of anything. It's in reducing the actual amount of energy that we need. So again, think of it. Oh, I keep doing this. Uh, let me discard. Apologies. For a think about it like this. You have this graph again and again. This was your activation energy. Now, again, same sort of thing, that green line was able to do it, the blue line wasn't. What if we said, all right, I put a catalyst in and now the new line is this. As you can see, the activation energy has reduced. By reducing our activation energy, more particles are gonna have sufficient energy to get through. So more of them are going to be able to do what we need to do. And so, Essentially, what we get out of this is we get a higher proportion of successful collisions. So, the way we describe it is like this. Catalyst we write an alternative reaction pathway with lower activation energy that allows more collisions to succeed. So, really important how we word this. And this is one of those buzzwordy things you need to do in an exam or a SAT, and you need to be on top of this. Please do not word this as it lowers the activation energy. No. You need to say it provides an alternative reaction pathway with a lower activation energy. With a lower activation energy. You do not want to say it lowers the activation energy. It does, but it does not. It does not lower the activation energy of the path it was on. You cannot alter that path. But if you change the path slightly, 
you are then able to lower it because the new path you take has a lower activation energy. So, as you can see here, it says, catalysts provide an alternative reaction pathway. That is the most important thing. Once you have that, the rest of the answer should be fine. You need to have this in there. So if there's one thing you come out of today, it is that. Come out of today with this. that. So it's important, the alternative reaction pathway, catalysts change the reaction mechanism, so they change how it occurs. You don't need to worry about that in intricate detail because that is not 3-4 chemistry. All you need to know is that it changes how it occurs in the mechanism of it. So as you can see here, here's a really nice diagram of what I drew before, but in you know a much nicer context, one that you could essentially copy and paste into your sort of if you're doing a summary book or you're doing, you know, you have a workbook that you keep your notes in, this is sort of the diagram you reproduce or copy and paste it into there. Um, so really important, that's kind of how it works. And you can see the different activation energies there. The delta H stays the same. The delta H does not change, and that's super duper important. So as you can see, cool. So we're gonna go through some practice questions. Usually what I do is I give you time and go through it. Well, what I'm gonna do with these now is I'm just gonna go through them. So I'm not going to give you time. For those of you who are watching the recording um, and not watching the live premiere, um, you are welcome to hit the pause button right now and have a go at it. I would, I would implore you to do that. I would implore those who are watching it to, to take a second and pause it and have a go at it. For those of you watching the live one, um, the premiere, you're not going to have the luxury of that, but that's okay because we're, um, I'm just going to go through the answers with you and I'm sure you have enough time to quickly work through them while I go through them if you just want to zone out quickly. Uh, but nonetheless, we have the oxidation of sulfur dioxide is an exothermic reaction. The reaction is catalyzed by vandium, V oxide, and you've got this here. Which of the following energy profile represents both the catalyzed and uncatalyzed? So remember, when we have this, we start with the same energy, we end with the same energy. So this one is wrong. This one is also wrong. How do I know that? Because they don't start with the same energy and they don't end with the same energy. So, cool. Move on to B and D. It says it's an exothermic reaction. This is endo. So this is wrong. Process of elimination, I've only got B left. I look at it, B is actually, it's correct anyway. Process elimination, I knew it was right before even looking at it, but B is correct there. We start at the same energy, we finish at the same energy, and the only thing that's different is the activation energy here. So, awesome. Moving on, so to summarize, these are the five major factors. You need to be really careful with these. You need to make sure you name them correctly. So you may be given a scenario, you need to make sure you name the right ones, um, and you really need to know sort of which ones apply to which, so obviously, your reaction rate in, in terms of successful um, proportion of collisions, and then the other one was how many collisions you get. So then you're gonna get more successful collisions naturally. So think about a proportion and number are sort of the two different ones. So again, we have another practice question. Again, pause if you're at home, but I'm gonna go through it. So what we have is bromomethane CH3Br, is toxic odorless colorless gas. It's used by quarantine authorities to kill insect pests. Simplified reaction, the simplified reaction for the synthesis is, you've got um, methanol, you've got HBr, and you end up with your bromomethane and water, and it is an exothermic reaction, and it is at 298. So, the manufacturer investigates the reaction conditions, the time of the process, and takes the percentage yield. So, this is actually what we're doing here, is leading us into our, sort of our next topic. So, this is sort of a little bit of a preface as to what we're about to go into. Predict the effect of change um, given below on the rate of the product of bromoethane at circular prediction. So, if we increase the temperature. So, this sort of question, this sort of question here, is very much what we would talk about with yield. And it was it's really going to talk about equilibria. But they've sneakily, very sneaky, they have produced a question here, and this is a V card question. I apologize, I put the thing in white, and I don't know why I did that. I will make sure to fix that up. Um, not sure why I made that white, so you're not gonna be able to see which exam I can't even remember what exam this one's from. I do apologize, I'll fix that up at the end. Um, but essentially where 
But this sort of question isn't an, an equilibria question. It's not a rate question. It's a yield question. But they've very sneakily made it into a rate question. They've gone, hey, what is the rate? What is the rate of production? Usually this would talk about yield. This is a very typical yield question, but they've actually made it rate. So then we think about it. It says, we're going to increase the temperature. So if we're talking about yield and you increase the temperature, you're actually going to go backwards. But we'll discuss that in a little bit. In this case here, what we're actually going to do is we're going to increase. Because when we increase the temperature, what happens? It increases. Why does it increase? So your reason. So it's going to increase. So usually you would circle, but I'm just going to write it. And then why? So you would say that in very shorthand, I'm going to write temp. You would never write it like this, but this is what I'm going to write at. Kinetic energy. Um, so of molecules. You would write out what those molecules are, but I'm just going to let shorthand this thing. So then you would say, one, there is increased collisions. And you would write, two, there is an increased proportion of successful collisions. I also apologize if you can just hear a word, like a word in the background. That's my laptop just struggling. It does this every time. There's no way around it. Um, so this is what you would write out as a paragraph. You are not going to write it out in shorthand like I just wrote it out. You're going to go ahead and write this as a paragraph. This is what you need. So this is a four mark question, which I think is a little bit absurd. I would really only warrant this a three mark question, but one mark here. And then you're essentially, I would say this is a two mark question. There is one mark for stating the thing about your information about energy kinetic. And then there is one mark for giving these two. In this question here, there's actually one mark for both proportion of collisions and the, uh, sorry, and the total collisions. I think that's way too many marks. This is a three mark question now. This was a little bit of an older question because I think it was like 2012 or 2011. Um, but essentially this question now is only really worth three marks. They're not gonna give this four, uh, but for the, case, for the sake of it, that is where your four marks were for those of you who sort of paused and had a go. So then we have predict the effect of each change given below on the rate of production of bromomethane um, and circle your prediction. So what if we increase the pressure? So again, we've got the same one. What's gonna happen when we increase pressure? Same thing, we've already talked about this, we're going to increase. Why is that? And this question here, you can only really give the one. You can say, as there is a sort of a smaller, smaller space or an increased, increased pressure, you have an increased movement um, and you end up with an increased, you know, uh, number of collisions. And with that increased number of collisions, you get an increased number of successful collisions. So I very much short handed these because I don't want to go through them in super detail and take up all your time. Um, successful collisions, apologies. But that is essentially how you go through a question like that. So moving on, Maxwell Boltzmann distribution. So this is the last year these are going to be in your exams. Um, so for those, you're all in year 12. Um, but uh, I'd say luckily for you, these are pretty straightforward um, and they're getting removed from the new study design, which I don't, I don't love, I'll be honest. But um, it's a good thing for you because these are quite straightforward marks in an exam. So a Maxwell-Boltzmann curve displays the energy profile of whatever you've got. So the molecules you've got are all in this energy profile here. Essentially what you've got here is you've got, this is the number of molecules, this is the kinetic energy. So this space under here, if you could find, you know, the space under that and do the maths for it, that would be the number of molecules. All your molecules are under there. Essentially what it's trying to tell you is that, hey, this is, so all the molecules that fall on here have this amount of energy. So maybe that's like two, whatever that is. The ones that are all here, they have four. The ones that are all here, they have six. The ones that are all here, they have eight. The ones that are all here have 10. You could say that this activation energy originally was at 8.5. Then you go and add a catalyst and that catalyst provides an alternative pathway and it's now at 6.5. Essentially, what this is trying to tell you is that prior, only this number, whatever that area is under there, that number of molecules could go through the reaction. There wasn't a lot. Then when we add the catalyst, there's still not that much, but there is a fair bit more because now all of these ones here can go through the reaction. So that is catalyst. So this one here is catalyst. 
Now, what happens if we actually increase the temperature? Well, what happens is we actually manipulate the curve. We don't move the activation energy line, we manipulate the curve. As you can see here, this was the original curve. Then when we increase the temperature, what we do is we actually flatten out the curve and push it forward. So we push it forward by going like this instead of going straight up and we flatten it by not getting as high. What that means is we're sort of just like, as we increase the temperature, some of them increase a little bit more than others. Everything's gonna increase, but some of them increase a little bit more and we get that little bit of extra height over here, but we lose a bit of height here. Same number of molecules, the area under that graph would be the exact same. The only thing that's changed is, as you can see here, this area here is much smaller than this area here. That's your difference there. So you can, again, get more particles going through the reaction. So as you can see here, there's a little meme to show you how things work. Memes are always a great way of learning, but you can have a look at these if you'd like. They're in the slides, which you have access to down below. So moving on, rate, um, rate of reaction. So rate of reaction is how fast. Now we're gonna go into extent. So extent is where we look at equilibrium and how far reaction goes. What do we get as our product? You know, how much reactants we have left, etc. So don't mix these too well. Then we need to talk quickly about irreversible versus reversible. Um, as we're gonna discuss later, and you may like to think of it like this, think about like, you know, your redox, reactions and think about sort of your galvanic cell versus your secondary cell. Think about secondary is technically, technically have galvanic in them. Think about your primary, actually that's probably a better way of saying it. Think about your primary, I don't know why I did that, versus your secondary. So you've got your primary cell, you've got your secondary cell. So primary, secondary. So some of the reactions are irreversible. So products can't be converted back into the products, uh, into the reactants. This is a irreversible. So for example, you can't unbake a cake. Um, whereas when we have a double arrow, so as you can see here, this is a single arrow. When you have this double arrow, which is you draw like this, and you're gonna have to get used to this for equilibria questions, not for, every, not for everything else, always just use a normal arrow, but for equilibrium questions where you're writing out a, a sort of uh, chemical reaction, it's really important you use this. And it just needs to look like that. It doesn't need to look fancy, doesn't need to look nice, just needs to look like that. So. Um, in this reaction, the products can also be converted back into the reactants. So you can go forwards and you can go backwards. So at equilibrium, the forward and the back or the reverse reaction exactly cancel each other out. So as you can see here, neither of these piles are gonna get bigger or smaller. As much as one of them is bigger and one of them is smaller, neither is gonna get bigger or smaller because these ants are moving at the same pace. As you can see here, they move at the same pace. They grab one from the other side, they take it across at the same pace. Nothing is gonna change. It's gonna be no movement, it's like a stalemate. Um, and the chemical reaction is described as dynamic. Now this is super, super key. Dynamic, this is super key, super high yield. What do we mean by dynamic? It means that the reaction is still occurring. The forward and the back reaction is still occurring even though to the naked eye, Nothing's happening. Everything is the same. You're looking at a chemical reaction where we have a change in color, let's say, a change in color. And we're going from, we talk about titrations, you all know titration, and it's gone from pink to clear. When we are at that, that end point, or the equivalence point technically is what we want to get to, but we'll talk about end point because that's what the naked eye sees. We get to that end point and we see this really slightly tinged pink clear what we see there is nothing happening. So we stop our titration and we see this slightly tinged, pinky clear, like you're at your perfect equilibrium. That's what we see. We see nothing happening, we just see that color. What's actually happening is those, you know, acids and bases that are still there are reacting still. And some of them are going from acid to base and some of them are going from base to acid and some of them are neutralizing, etc. We're still getting that forward and that back reaction. They're still occurring they're occurring at the exact same rate. There is no change in rate at all. Um, we are getting the exact same rate forward and backwards, and by getting that exact same rate, nothing looks like it's happening. But something is happening, and that's why we refer to it as dynamic. So, as you can see here, when we have a rate time graph, when we have the forward and the back reaction, and they equal each other, 
we refer to that as equilibrium. So from this point to this point, this is at equilibrium. This is at equilibrium. So rate of forward and back reaction equals. Now, when we talk about concentration time graph, so this says amount, but think of it as a concentration time graph. So the concentration of the reactors and the concentration of the products, all we require is both lines to be going straight. They don't need to match up. They do not need to match on top of each other, but they need to be straight. So they need to be perfectly parallel, horizontal straight. That's what needs to be happening. Up until this point here, all of this is reacting and there's a change and it's visible change. Here, we're at equilibrium. So we're back at equilibrium when this line is straight. So concentration of chemicals don't change. So again, reversible reactions will attain equilibrium when forward and reverse reactions are equal. The system will remain at equilibrium unless it is disturbed. What happens at equilibrium? So the forward reaction rate equals the reverse reaction rate. Um, the net reaction rate is forward take reverse equals zero. And then the concentration of chemical species are constant. So they are the three key rules here. Or really these two rules are the same. So you really have one and you have two. You have two key rules to being at equilibrium. And that's what matters there. So here's a fun example. So if we think about if we drink 0.1 molar of what we've got here is a weak acid, and then we drink 0.1 molar of a strong acid. Which one are we going to choose? So let's have a think about this. And this, this is a very, please do not do this. This is a very dangerous example. And I don't know why it says drinking, uh, but nonetheless, we're just going to think about it. So we have a weak acid and we have a strong acid. We have a very strong acid, HNO3, and HNO3 is 99% ionization. Now, Ionization is loosely part of ACA chemistry, but it's very, if it is going to be in a SACA exam question, they're going to describe what it means. So I'm going to describe what it means to you right now. Essentially what it means is that when we have this, when we have this chemical equation occurring, it's going to be one, when we're at equilibrium, it's going to be 1% this, 99% this. The other one here, we're 1% ionization. We are going to be 1% this, 99% this. Now, what, make, what makes acids so dangerous to us? Beyond acids that literally break down whatever they touch, so think about, you know, think about the, the whole sci-fi way of thinking about acid. Those of you who have watched the Alien movies, um, that whole sci-fi idea that, you know, when the alien was injured, it had acid blood and the acid, like, you know, seeped through the metal and just destroyed everything. That's a very sci-fi way of thinking about it. Yes, acid does work like that, but that is a very over-the-top theory of it. Um, think about it like that. Um, acids like that are very, like, they have to be extremely strong for that to occur. So this stuff here, it's not good for you, but having that in your body is not the end of the world. Having this in your body is a big deal. Why is this a big deal? Because what happens if you've got lots of this? You become super acidic in your gut. Your gut becomes super, super acidic. And... Um, we know, well, we probably don't know because you guys probably haven't been through it, but this is some topic unit four area of study two stuff, but your body has different pHs in different spots. And that's how we sort of have enzymes in different spots that operate in different spots because the enzymes and those proteins have optimal pHs for those locations. Your gut already is acidic. It's already sits at about two or three. It's one of the only acidic places in your body. But if you add in a bit of this, why do I keep doing it? If you add in a bit of this, 99% of it is going to form into this and this. This here is super dangerous. What it's going to do is it's going to cause your body to become, your stomach becomes super acidic and you, the reality is you're probably going to die, depending on how much you have, but you're going to die. Um, and that's because 99% of it converts into that. Whereas if you drink a weak acid like this, only 1% of it becomes our acid, which is here or our H pluses, which cause you to get really, really um, acidic. When only 1% of it comes, it becomes H plus. You're going to need to drink a lot of this one to cause any damage. Obviously, none of, none of you are going to do this. But this is an example of trying to get your head around sort of what is going on in terms of equilibrium. When this is at equilibrium here, there's lots of this. When we're at equilibrium here, there's lots of this. The reaction 
rather sits on one side. Now, this is all just chemistry and there are reasons why this occur, but you do not need to know for the scope of VCE. What you need to know is that in this case of ionization, 99% of it becomes that, whereas when you don't have a really strong ionization, we had 99% of it staying as it was. So this one is far safer than this one. So that's how we talk about extent. So extent of a chemical reaction is described by its equilibrium constant K. Um, and K, the larger the K is, so really important to think, the larger the K is, the more products we have. So in this case of an ionization one, we have a really, really, it should be a large K, that's a small K. And if I got this mixed up, I'm trying to think again in my head. Um, small K. Well, in this case, we have a really big K here and we have a really small K here. Um, and when we have a really big K, I think this one's, these ones are actually mixed up by the way. It should be the other way around. I do apologize. But when you have a really big K, you're going to have lots and lots of product. So in this case here, these Ks we're flipping over. When you have a K of 22, you're going to have lots of this. However, when you have a K of 1.5 by 10 to the negative 5, which is a really, really small K. Uh, oh, no, these are not flipped over. These, so apologies, I'm going to be looking at myself right now, watching this recording, my future me, and going, you're an absolute nuffy, Josh. Um, I flipped the, the, I flipped the uh, equations, and then that just baffled me. Apologies. This is correct, because this was the safer one. Apologies, I was just having a nuffy moment there. Um, this is the safer one. Um, and given it has a really, really low K value. So having a really low K value is good because in this case here, we're going to keep a lot of this. A really low K value in something where we want to get lots of product is not that useful because we're not going to get a lot of product. And you cannot manipulate a K value. Really important K value is, is depend on the temperature, will be the same no matter what your equation. In the other case here, the K value is really high because we get lots of this. Um, and why do I know which one's going to be a high K value and which one's going to be a low K value given I only had the ionization sort of percentages? Because of this equation here. So this is how you calculate K. K is essentially products over reactants, but in a very sort of more technical way. Essentially what you get is the concentration of each of your values at equilibrium or each of your molecules, types of molecules at your equilibrium. And you put the concentrations in these little squares here. And then if they have a constant in front of them, so your chemical equation, if it's got a constant in front of it, like it needed um, equaling out or balancing, you then go and put them up here. And then you calculate K value. If your K value is really high, what does it tell you? It tells you you have lots of products. If your K value is really small, it tells you you don't have a lot of products. So the concentration um, of A at equilibrium is essentially what that means. And then um, like delta H and E, uh, e and naught, K values are associated with chemical equations. The K value depends only on the temperature. The only thing that can manipulate a K value is the temperature. So a K value for a chemical equation is going to be the same no matter what, unless the temperature is changed. Really important. Um, and then we have Q values. Q values are a little bit different because you've got equilibrium constant and then you've got Q values. Equilibrium constants, really important, are, are K and they are only at equilibrium. I don't know why it's keep zooming in, but they are only at equilibrium. Q is the exact same equation, but when you are not at equilibrium. So if you are not at equilibrium, Q will be the value. Now, the Q value will then be different to K and it will be different no matter what for your chemical equation if you are not at equilibrium because you may be really far on one side or really far on the other side. But the Q value will get closer and closer and closer to K as the equation root gets closer and closer to equilibrium. Once it reaches equilibrium, it becomes K. The moment it reaches equilibrium, that Q value becomes a K value. And that is the difference. Now, the other thing you really need to know with this is how to manipulate K values. Um, you won't ever really manipulate Q values, but you will manipulate K values. How do I manipulate a K value? Well, what happens if I reverse my equation? Well, what am I going to do? If you look at it, this was K1 and this was the first equation. Then what if I flipped it? Well, C and D became the reactants and A and B became the products. So I just flip which way the reactants products go. The simple way of doing that in maths is go one over K. 
one. So if you've already calculated k one, just put one over the top of it and put it in the calculator. What if I double the equation? Well, by doubling the equation, all I've done is added some constants out the front. What do I do with the constants? I put them to the power of. So what if I add together equations? So I've gone, all right, A goes to B plus C, or L what I've come back to, so it's a double, uh, double arrow. And then I have D plus E goes to F with a double arrow. Well, what if I want to add those two equations together? Well, I'm going to go A plus D plus E goes to or comes back to B plus C plus F. Well, I just add the two together. And the simple way of doing that with your K values, if you have these two K values, is to multiply these two together. It's actually how it would work. You could go ahead and do this and you'll get the same answer as that. Um, so you're welcome to do it either way, but the easier way is to go K1 times K2, given if you already have these values here. So you do need, do need to know how to manipulate those things. Um, and that's sort of important as well. So yeah, that is essentially our K and Q values. So we have a quick practice question here. I do apologize that the other ones I put the writing in white. I don't know why I did that, but I put this one in black. So this is from our ATI notes 2019 practice exam. Again, for those of you who are not watching this live, please pause, um, but for us. The equilibrium constant for the formation of sulfur trioxide is given below. We have two SO2 plus O2 goes to and comes back to two SO3. Now it's 2.8 by 10 to the two, which is essentially a hundred. So um, just quickly doing it on my calculator because I know I'll just make an error. Is 280, which is what I thought it would be. So we have 280. So that is actually our K value. Um, as you can see, it says KC, that just means K constant. You don't need to do that, but for the sake of it, that's what's there. Then it says, all right, we actually, what do we do? We flipped this because this went to things. So what we did is we did one over 280. And then what is the other thing we did? We halved it because this halved and then this went to one and this went to one. Now, just a really important fact, for the sake of chemistry exams, when you're writing out a chemical equation, please, please, if you're ever balancing, do not use fractions or de do not use decimals, but fractions, fractions are acceptable, but they don't look good. We don't have half our O2 molecule, that doesn't happen. So in this case here, this equation, if you wrote this equation down, obviously this is for a question, so it's fine. But if you wrote this, this equation down in a short answer question, personally, I, it's wrong. Um, for the sake of chemistry, they do accept it in some, in some occurrences and in some occurrences they don't accept it. So it's really important that you just don't do it at all in case they don't accept it. So please use whole numbers. You would double this. In this case here, we're, we're talking about um, everything else that's going on. So in this case here, essentially what we've got is one over 280 and sort of squaring this as well. So if we go, all right, um, we're going to go sorry I'm trying to go and that's one two what you'll find here is that your answer is a um, because essentially what you're going to get here is 1.3 by 10 to the negative 5 so that's how you go about that one there. Um, and I'm just checking it another way. Um, why this won't let me, have I got the rotation lock on? I don't, apologies. I don't know, I do not have my normal calculator here. Well, it is not letting me go like this. Yes, that's what we wanted. Squared, we still get the same answer. So I'm gonna show you all how I do it. You're probably not gonna be able to see, but essentially if you have some questions about it, just let me know. But on this calculator, I've got one, divided by 280, got my answer of 0 0.035, uh, and then I have squared my answer. And I've got 0 0.000127. If I move my decimal place, I go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, I get 1.27, which is 1.3 by 10 to the negative 5. My answer here is A. So the other thing that I want to touch on quickly before we get into our graphs, because we're going to go through some graphs very quickly, is ice tables. Um, there are some examples here um, that you're welcome to go through, but essentially I'm not gonna go through them, but ice tables are really useful if you're given enough information. So you really just need sort of, you need at least one here and one here that match up. 
because then once you have that, you can have this, and then you can sort of figure figure out everything else that's going on. Um, your ice tables are really valuable, as you can see here. We didn't have what was in red, and then we figured out what was in red, um, and we went about it. So really useful um, to use, um, and please try and use them as much as you can. As you can see here, the answers that just went in there. So um, this is a practice question. I'm not gonna go through this one. Um, the answers are on the next slide. Um, so for those of you who wanna have a go at it, um, please pause it right now um, and have a go at it. Three, two, one. As you can see, here are the answers here, um, and you can go about getting your correct K value there. But for the sake of time, we're not gonna go through that one. That's a good question for all of you to go through. So what I want to quickly go through is I put these slides in. I just wanted to quickly go over how our reaction rate, sort of how our graphs work um, and how you can sort of manipulate these graphs. So as you can see here, I'm going to go through one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There are nine slides on these and we're just going to go through them in a couple of minutes. We're not going to spend too much time, but essentially what we've got is we're going to have different equations and what we're going to do is we're going to add or take away or divide or remove or adding something different. We're going to go over all the different ones or add a catalyst or whatever is going on. And these are concentration time. And then we'll also look at rate time. So in this case here, we've added a product or reactant, either one. What have we done here? We've added a product, a uh, reactant, sorry. We've added N2 gas because you can see here, we're at equilibrium all the way up until here. So all the way up until here, we're at equilibrium. Then all of a sudden we added some N2 gas, as you can see, was this little spike here. We added some N2 gas. Essentially, when that N2 gas was added, we were out of equilibrium, we needed to get back to equilibrium. By doing so, we needed to reduce our N2, we needed to increase our NH3, because by reducing it, we're gonna go forward. We're also then going to inadvertently reduce our H2. Now, how do we know how much we're reducing or increasing by? Now, these should be big, these shouldn't have been subtext, sorry. How do we know how much we're increasing or reducing by? Well, what the first thing I want to say to all of you is that draw an imaginary line here. This N2 should never go below this line. It should never touch that line. It should always be above it because you've added more to this system. So when it reaches equilibrium, there needs to be more of this still. So when it reaches back at equilibrium, this needs to be more. So essentially you've gone up and then you're going to come back down. Now, there is a one out the front here, there is a three, there is a two. So however much of this goes down by, how much you decide to draw it down by, which you can draw it down as much as you want or as little as you want, as long as it doesn't touch this line or get near it, doesn't matter. That area there for NH3, I'm gonna double it. So treat this like maybe like one centimeter. This is going to be a two centimeter rise. For my H2, this, is going to be a three centimeter reduction. Because as the reaction went forward, this one goes down, this one goes down, this one goes up. You need to make sure you use the constants as your factors by how much things go up and down. For this one, it went down by one centimeter. So therefore this one needs to go up by double that. So this was one centimeter, this needs to go up by two. This one here was three. So it needs to go up by three times that. Think of it like molar ratio, same sort of thing. That's what we're working with here. Um, and then we reached a new equilibrium where this blue line was. Um, for our forward and back reaction, what you'll find is if something is added, there is more concentration in there. So what's gonna happen? The rate overall is gonna be quicker, but we're still gonna be at equilibrium. So we've just reached a new equilibrium here and essentially think of these lines on top of each other at the same rate. Um, but essentially right here, we've reached equilibrium again. And this equilibrium just has a slightly higher dynamic pace the pace of the dynamic sort of forward and back is just a little bit higher. Now I know those are terrible lines, but essentially think of it like that. Um, and what went up, the forward or the back reaction the most? Well, the forward reaction went up the most, first of all, because if we think about it, we needed more um, of our NH3 initially. So our forward reaction is the one that's gonna go up quickly. Now, again, sorry for the subtext, I don't know why I did that. Uh, but essentially this one went forward first, and then this one went sort of increased as this one went down. So in this system initially at equilibrium 
and then we get the addition of N2 and then the equilibrium established again. Cool. Now, what if we dilute something? So we're not gonna remove something, now we're gonna look at diluting. What if we diluted this whole thing? What if we just added water in and diluted this whole thing down? Well, what actually happens is everything decreases. The concentration of everything decreases because remember concentration is moles over liters. And if we dilute something all the way down, we're still gonna have the same number of moles, but we're gonna have an increased number of liters. So think about it as moles. Oh, I don't want that second line there. The moles is going to be constant. And then the liquid is going to increase. So therefore your number is going to decrease overall. So your concentration is going to decrease. So think of it like this that kind of stands for concentration. So overall, you get a concentration decrease for all three of them. However, as you notice, two of them then went up and one of them went down. How do I justify that? The way of justifying this is looking at the number of molecules on each side. So on this side, there is one, two. There is two on the left and there is one on the right. Despite the fact this molecule is probably a little bit bigger in size, doesn't matter. You've got two on the left, one on the right. How do I overall increase my sort of my concentration of everything within there? How do I get back to a, a point where I'm happy? How do I do that? Well, what do I do is I actually go to the left. And again, we worked on ratios. Everything was of the same ratio here. So this was the same distance as this was the same as distance as this. All these distances were the same. And essentially what you've got here is this concentration um, increasing for both SCN uh, and Fe3+, because there's two of them on the left and there's one on the right, so this one's gonna decrease. So we're gonna push back to the left. Now, what if, what if for theory's sake, there was a two here and I had two here? I know that doesn't make any sense because it's not right, but just for theory's sake. Well, in this case here, you would actually go like this. You'd go, all right, get down to here and then I'm just gonna go straight. I'm not actually gonna get a change. Nothing's gonna change because there's no ability to change. For this one, this one's just gonna go straight. For this one, this one is just gonna go straight. They're just gonna go straight. That is, it's at equilibrium. When it reaches this point here, we're at equilibrium still, if these are two and two. Um, and again, for our dilution with our rate, it goes down, it goes the opposite. Um, and then as you can see here, um, we wanted to increase our SCN and FE3+. plus. So this one stayed higher initially and this one reduced initially because we didn't want as much FESN2. Now, what if we change pressure? So what have we done here? Have we increased or decreased the pressure? We've increased the pressure because we've got more concentration. So our liquid, if we think about it, or our space, our volume has decreased in this one. Again, these should not be subtext. Um, I think that was just the way I typed it out, apologies. Uh, but essentially, that is what's going on here. So everything has increased. So because everything is increased, what do we want to do as a system? We want to decrease. So here I've got one, two, I have three particles on the left. I have two on the right. So which one has less? It's the SO3. So we're going to go forwards. So the SO3 has increased. Um, as you can see here, we have a space there that is, as you can see here, is about, you know, it's about equal to this. It's probably not perfectly equal, but these two here are meant to be equal. And then this one is going to be half of it. Um, but essentially for the production of these graphs on uh, PowerPoint, they weren't perfect. Now, moving on, again, change in pressure, everything's going to increase, but we want to, we want to get more SO3. So our forward reaction is going to increase more. Um, change in temperature, change in temperature, there's no immediate change. Now, this is why K value changes because in all of these ones, we have an immediate change and then we work our way back. So during this phase here, we have a Q value and then we work our way back to a K value that is the same. Temperature, we have a Q value, you know, from here to here, we have a Q value. Then we work our way to a different K value. This is a different K value because we've had a change in temperature and temperature is the only thing that will change the K value. Super important. So two NO2 gas um, can come back to or go to um, N2O4 gas. And as you can see here, um, we've had a temperature change and 
with that temperature change, I'm going to say we've added heat. For the sake of it, we've increased the temperature. By increasing the temperature, what we've done is we've increased the amount of NO2 and we've decreased the amount of N2O4. So we've increased the back reaction. What does that tell me about this equation? That tells me this equation is exothermic. Now, how do I know that? We would have a negative delta H. And again, how do I know that? Because when I add the temperature, I want to cool the system down. So what's, how do we cool the system down? Well, we cool the system down by going backwards because this side would be the hot side because when we go through an exothermic reaction, remember with like combustion, exothermic, we get a lot of heat getting produced. When we go through an endothermic reaction, so let's say this was endothermic, this would get cooler because it's absorbing energy into the system. Um, but essentially that energy is, it's, it's making it cooler. Um, so I think of this as the hot side, I think of this is the cold side. So we want to go towards the cold side, so we're going to go backwards. Now, if this had been an endothermic reaction, it's the opposite. This would be the cold side. I'm just going to say Y and X, and then this would be the hot side. So this is, oh, actually I'll write it out nicely. So, and then I say delta H equals, I'll make that negative. So let's just get rid of all these scribbles over here so I don't confuse people. And I'm going to say y x delta h equals positive. What I've got is I've got cold and I've got cold. And then I have hot and I have hot. So depending on what you do, if you reduce the temperature or increase the temperature, you're going to go to the opposite. Um, and that's how I know what's going on here. Now, important here, for this one here, we've said, what have we done with the temperature? We've actually reduced the temperature. Um, otherwise, you can also increase the temperature. Um, now, also the other really important one is catalyst. Catalyst is really important if it was a concentration time graph, so concentration time, and you had two things, and then all of a sudden you added a catalyst in here, it would still look like this. Nothing's going to change. You're not going to increase. Uh, that shouldn't have gone up. It looks terrible. You know what I mean. Nothing's going to change. That was terrible. Let me uh, redo that one. Nothing is going to change. They're going to stay the same. Um, and when you add a catalyst, the only thing that's going to change is a rate graph. It's going to go up, but then it's going to stay the same. You're always going to be at equilibrium. So again, we have another practice question here where we've only got about 50 minutes left, a little bit less. So what I'm actually going to do is skip over this practice question. I do apologize. Um, again, this is, I've actually quoted in this one this time. Apologies. I've given you part A, which is the information you need. Please have a go at this question and then go to the exam and have a look at it. Um, so for those of you at home, welcome to pause and have a go at it now. For those of you watching the premiere, please come back to this question afterwards. It's slide 52. Um, and please have a go at it there. So that might be a good way of doing that. So, block two, electrochem. Again, those of you who are watching the recording, welcome to take a break now. We're halfway through, a little bit over halfway through, but we're on to electrochem. Um, which we've got about 40 slides on, a little bit less, about, yeah, about 40 slides on, um, and we'll punch through that now. So, all things electrochem, all these wonderful, I'm going to be real, they're disgusting diagrams that VCAR give us, but there's nothing we can do about it, so we're going to work our way through them. So, VCAR loves to make this the hardest subject, and I'll be honest with you, I've been tutoring chemistry, this is my fifth year of tutoring, chem tutoring chemistry, um, both like through ATAR notes and I've, I've done private stuff. I've done, I've done everything. And I still to today struggle with electrochem at times. Um, it was the subject I, the topic I found the most difficult in year 12. And the reason I found it the most difficult was exactly this year. VCAR don't like to make this straightforward because electrochem in a sense is actually quite straightforward. Electrochem, when you put a really disgusting, ugly diagram, it's really, really confusing. So if you are one of those people out there who does redox, sees a really weird diagram and then sort of self-capitulates and goes, I have no idea what's going on, you're not alone. That was me in year 12. And even to today, sometimes I see diagrams and I think I think it was probably the 2020 or 2021 VCAR exam. Like I, I'd been tutoring and I feel like through tutoring, I've become stronger at chemistry. And I remember looking at it and going, God, I'm so happy I'm not in this exam because it was just a really confusing diagram. It was one of the years, it was like 2019, 2020, or 2021, one of the ones. Um, and it was just a really confusing diagram. And I sat there and I'm like, oh, this is really confusing because that's what it is. And 
what I'm going to try and get through to you today is that don't be scared of them. The best way to attack Electrochem is to take a step back and go, all right, what do I actually have? Like, this is confusing, but what do I have? What's actually going on? What do I, what can I say is going on? What can I be like, all right, one, where's my attic? Where's my cabinet? Where's my sulfuric or electrolyte? What is my electrolyte? Is it acidic or is it basic? Um, what are my electrodes? Do I have inert ones? Do I have something? Where are these on my E and O table? They take a step back and figure out what you have before you jump into the questions with a super confusing diagram. And that's my really big tip for electrochem. Is there anything you take out of today? That's what I want you to take out. Is they purposely give you confusing diagrams. Electrochem is always one of the most poorly answered questions. You just need to take a step back. In actual fact, these diagrams are usually pretty straightforward. You just need to take a step back and go, all right, what do I have? What do I have? What do I have? What do I have? Take that deep breath and go, I've got this, I've got that. All right. And then you can work your way through it. Um, but you're not alone if you don't like Electrochem. I'm a big advocate for not liking Electrochem. So let's talk about Redox Basics very quickly. Do I like to take a drink of water? So, Redox Basics, let's just go through basically what are the easy and hard things that we've got here. So we've got um, oil rig. I'm sure you've all heard of oil rig. Oxidation involves loss, production involves gain. As you can see, oxidation, you lose electrons, reduction, you gain electrons. The other thing that's really, really confusing is the terminology. The oxidant and the reductant. The oxidant, I may call it an oxidizing agent as well, because that's what it was kind of called back in my day. We call it oxidant, it's really important. The oxidant causes oxidation, but it itself is reduced. The reductant causes reduction, but it itself is oxidized. Think of it like the teacher. The teacher does the teaching, but is not themselves taught. So they teach you, but they themselves are not taught. It's like the oxidant does the oxidizing, but is not itself oxidized. Really, really important way of thinking about it. Um, I'm not going to speak too much on that stuff because the more I talk, I feel like the more people get confused. So we're not going to talk about that too much. Um, obviously, the other thing that's really important here is that oxidation and reduction always occur together. You cannot just have oxidation on the side. You cannot just have reduction on the side. You have to have them both occurring for it to work. And that's really important. So uh, electrons are sort of lost by one species. Um, they have to be gained somewhere. It's sort of that theory of um, electrolysis. You can't sort of lose things. Um, I'm just checking that was all working out, sorry. So it's kind of like that energy conservation theory. You cannot sort of lose things. So moving to a very appropriate meme because it's more appropriate now. Um, we have sort of three equations here and I ask you, how do we determine which of these reactions is redox? Now, for those of you who have done redox already, this will be straightforward. You go, oh, I know which one it is. As you haven't, maybe a little bit more difficult. What I want to teach us very quickly is oxidation states. I'm sure you all know them, but I just want to sort of get a very uh, an understanding between all of us about what they are there for. They are a tool. Think of it like a tradie, and a tradie has their tool belt. In their tool belt, you know, they have their hammer, they have their drill, they have their tape measure, they have their pencils and, you know, their rulers and all that sort of stuff. They are tools. They are building something else completely, but they are the tools they need to build or do whatever they are doing. Same thing with oxidation numbers. They are not the actual redox. They are not the actual chemistry. They are a tool. They are a tool you need to understand what's going on in the redox equation. So there's a few rules to remember. Um, hopefully you're feeling comfortable with these. So one, oxidation states of free elements are zero. Two, oxidation states of simple ions are as they are. So Na plus is plus one, Cl minus is negative one, Mg two plus is two plus, N3 minus is negative three, etc. Don't think I need to go through that in too much more detail. Um, in compounds, we have um, a couple of rules. So main group metals, have oxidation states equal to the charge of their ions. So NaCl, we're going to have Na as plus one. Let's sort of move across a little bit, but it's going to be there. Um, Mg2 plus, it's going to be two plus. Uh, MgBr2, sorry, is always going to be the Mg, it's always going to be two plus. Next rule, hydrogen is almost always plus one and oxygen is almost always negative two. Now, 
there is one example for both of those that always comes up, and that is H2O2. I've not seen an example of a hydrogen negative one, and I've never seen a, any other example of H2O, sorry, of oxygen being negative one in any other case. The only case where it is negative one is H2O2, and it has come up a couple of times. And H2O2 is, what do you think it is? It's hydrogen peroxide. So H2O2 is very dangerous. It's a poison, um, but and it is poisonous when it is produced accidentally. Um, but hydrogen peroxide is the only one that's ever come up. Again, hydrogens are still plus one. Oxygens in this are actually negative one. They're actually not plus, they're actually not negative two in this case. I should bring that one out. Trying to make that look cool, but we didn't. So we have, we have plus ones and we have negative ones. So in this case, it's the only example that's come up ever where those the rule has changed. Um, and then the sum of oxidation states must equal the charge on the species. So if we look here, we've got CO2, we've got plus four and we've got negative two, and then overall we've got a charge of zero. And that's why we've got two O's because when you multiply by two, you get negative four, plus four, negative four, cancel out. This is a really good way of using your oxidation states is drawing them out like this, putting what is the individual at the top? What is the total at the bottom? So individual at the top, total at the bottom. It's a very good way of sort of figuring out what you have and what's going on. So I really like this way of doing it. I always implore my students to do it this way. I think it's the best way to go about it. So as you can see here, we have some equations here that we just discussed. Which of these is going through redox? Well, the first one isn't, the second one isn't, but the third one is. Because we've gone through and we've applied our rules. And we had rule one here where we had our free elements. So these are free elements. We were, um, they were all together. So we had AL by itself and then we had CL2 gas. So free elements, then zero. And then we had a, um, a compound next and the compound had AL and CL3. And AL is a metal. So it was always going to be a three plus and stay as a three plus. And then our CL manipulate to that. CL generally is always negative one, but in this case it manipulated to negative one anyway. Um, and so we had negative one, which three of those is negative three, cancel out, be zero, we have redox. All the other ones there, we have no change in oxidation states. With no change in oxidation states, they are not redox. So a reaction will only be redox if two or more as change in oxidation state. So if, that's just, if the oxidation state reduced, it's reduced, if the oxidation state increases, it's oxidized. So AL goes from zero to three plus, it's oxidized. Um, CL goes from zero to negative one, it is reduced. So then the next part is balancing half equations. And we're only going to touch on this really, really quickly. So how do we actually figure out the half equations? The, the equation mark. Um, there are two ways of doing this. The first way is to gain them from your E and naught table. So from this bad boy here. So if I scroll down, uh, my computer is really struggling because it's lagging when I scroll. This one here, electrochemical series, or I like to call the naught series. This will have your answer about 90% of the time. And that is not a joke. There are so many times um, I've had students in the past, and, and I was also a culprit of this. I got a question where it was like, what is the half equation? And I went ahead and I used the Coase method, which we're about to discuss, and I produced it. And it was a total waste of time because all it wanted me to do is go to the data book and go, all right, there it is there, and rip it out and chuck it on my page. That's all it wanted. So really, really, really be aware of this. A lot of the time they will just be asking for you to go to the chemical series, grab out what you want, stick it on the page. So let's jump back to this. We use the Coase method um, and we're happy with that. So we've had a look at our E0 table. There's nothing there. I was, trying, I, mean, trying, I was trying to say we look at the E0 series. It's not there. We're happy with that. So we go to the Coase method. So Coase method. Start out with K. So you have two molecules. In this case, you may have, you know, what's a good one? I'm trying to give a good one. Top of my head. Um, ooh, dichromate. Dichromate. Then what does dichromate go to? Uh, Cr2O7. Uh, it's like two minus, I think. That may not be perfectly correct, but for the sake of it, that's what we're going to use. So 
we're going to go through an example as this one does. Cr2, O7 negative, and then I believe it goes to Cr3 plus. Now, please do not hold me to that because that may be quite wrong, um, but we're going, to, we're going to work with that for now. So this is dichromate to chromium ions. So that's what we got. First of all, it says balance your key atoms. So all atoms except for HNO. So I have two chromium atoms on the left. I have one on the right. So what am I going to do? I'm going to balance. So I'm going to add a two here. I'm happy with that. Then it says balance oxygen atoms. So I'm going to balance my oxygen atoms by adding H2O. So I have seven on the left. So I am going to add seven on the right. So I'm actually going to make my seven a different color. I like to uh, seven. H2O, and that's going to be a liquid. Um, I'm going to make these aqueous as well. Just for the sake of it, I'm going to make these aqueous. Then it says, balance my hydrogens by adding H pluses. So I have 14 here, and I have none here. So I'm going to add 14 on this side here. So I have 14 on the left, None on the right because I've got my other 14 within the H2O. And then my next step is to balance my charges. So by adding E minuses. So overall on this side, I believe this is negative two. I'm not 100% sure. We're just going to, we're going to say it's negative two. We're going to say we're at positive 12 here because we've got positive 14 and negative two. On the other side here, we've got positive three. We're going to say this is positive six because we've got two of them. So I'm going to need to add six E minus to this side because that will give me a charge of negative six, which will bring this charge down to plus six and it will cancel out with that. So I need to add, and I didn't give myself enough room. That was a bit of a rookie error. Always leave yourself lots of room on these questions. Six E minus. Now, Electrons do not have a state, so you don't need to worry about that. And then the last step here is don't forget your states. I did them as I went through, so I don't need to worry about that last step. So code with the S on the end. I'm not just going to get rid of that so you can see what I did. I just went through the codes method. Now, really important. I just went through the codes method for an acidic solution. Now, why did I say it's an acidic solution? Because I added H pluses. Also, what's really important here is this is what you do if they don't mention acidic or alkaline. If there is no mention of acidic or alkaline, you work off acidic. Really important. Acidic is what you fall to. Now, if they do mention and they say, hey, you're in an alkaline environment, you add in an extra step. And that extra step is here. You add in OH minuses to both sides. So you cancel out, cancel out the hydrogen ions by adding in OH minus to both sides. Essentially what that looks like is in the last one here, so if I go back to here and I say, all right, I'm at that step. So before the electrons, I get rid of these electrons here. Before the electrons and actually you know what I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna rule out, not rule out, rub out all of that because it's just gonna annoy me and get in my way. All right, cool, go back. So I had negative two and then I had 14 H plus. So I'm at this stage here. I right, did my H plus in the wrong color, my 14 in the wrong color. So you know, annoyed me as well. So I'm at this stage here. And then I don't have my E minuses yet. I add in this step. The H is the OH ions. So I want to cancel out all my H pluses. So what am I going to add? I'm going to add 14 OH minuses. So I'm actually going to end up with, I'm going to rub this out. I'm going to end up with, 14 H2O. Now, on the other side, I've got seven. So what's that gonna do? It's actually going to go, okay, I'm actually going to say, that's gonna cancel out. So I get rid of all of that. And I actually only end up with, I actually only end up with seven H2Os now. So. That's all I've got. I've cancelled out my H2Os on the other side and I added 14 OH minuses to this side. So what do I need to add here? I need to add 14 
OH minus aqueous to this side as well. You need to add it to both sides. You cannot just add it to one, you need to add it to both. So by adding it to the left side, I cancelled out my H pluses and made them H2Os. The H2Os then cancelled out with the H2Os on the other side and I was left with seven on the left. My 14 OH minuses on the right don't cancel out, they just go there. Now I need to put my electrons in. So I have negative two here and I have positive six, negative 14. I have uh, negative eight. So again, I need to add the same amount of electrons to the left side. So I still end up adding the same amount of electrons. Um, I've just changed what I have. So this is now, I'll bring a line through that. This is now alkaline. So we need to know how to do those two steps. So pushing forward, um, there was a question here that was meant to have, uh, this question here was meant to have, uh, what you call it, it was meant to have animations, but for some reason I didn't add animations in. So here's the answer to this practice question. You have O2 and you have H2O. So first step, you write them out. Second step, obviously give yourself some more room. There is no K for this one because there's no other atoms. So you go straight to O. So by going to O, I say, all right, how many oxygen? I'm already balanced out. That was this first step here. So I added in the two. So O done. H, add in our hydrogens. I did, done. Then it wants it in a basic solution or alkaline. So I go, apologies, I'm gonna have to write that all out again. I don't know why I did that. So I've already done the K, which wasn't there. I did the O, which was there. Did the H, which was there. Then I add the second H by going here. Now this second H is both these steps here. As you can see, it's actually this third step here as well. And then what I would do is I'd go to the E and add my electrons, which really is both these two steps here. And then I add my states, which I haven't done, but nonetheless, I forgot to put the animations in there. So we'll move on. Now, moving into just galvanic cells and a little bit of electrochem very quickly. Um, Remember just one of the key things about galvanic cells is that it's chemical energy to electrical energy. And the most important thing here is that a cell is an individual sort of chemical bit. A battery is lots of cells together. So the batteries we work with in everyday life have lots and lots of cells and that's really, really important. So then a basic galvanic cell, I'm gonna fly through this because you know how to do this, but we have two half cells, we have two electrodes, we have two electrolytes, one on either side, we have an external circuit, we have an internal circuit, which is our salt bridge. And that is about it. You just need to label these things, plus you need to label the flow of electrons. Now, which way do electrons go? They always go anode to cathode. No matter what, recharging, discharging, no matter what, they're always anode to cathode. A to C. That is electron flow. You always need to have that. So these are the things you need to label. Um, you also need to label where, which way the, uh, the ions go. Blah, blah, blah. So the ions, if they go left or they go right, and the cations, which way they go, the anions, which way they go, etc. So what we have here is a very basic galvanic cell. We've got a, I think it's like called like a Drew cell or something. I'm not even sure it's like a Daniel or a Drew or something. Anyway, we got zinc and we got copper. What are we gonna do? We're gonna look through and go, all right, where are we? So if we look at this, I have these things here. I want a spontaneous reaction, so I'm going top left, bottom right. So, copper two plus and zinc solid. So, essentially I'm gonna get zinc solid to zinc two plus, which is going to lose electrons. Which one loses electrons? That's oxidation. So this is going to be oxidation. This is going to be reduction. So, moving on, I'm getting rid of those. So, I have my oxidation, I have my reduction. I have my anode, because oxidation, anode, negative. I have my cathode, which is positive, happy cat, and it is my reduction. I have my flow of electrons from anode to cathode, and then I have my anions going to the left and my cations going to the right. So cat to cat, anions to anions, anions to anode. As you can see here, the zinc is eventually gonna break down, and on here, the copper is gonna build up. So that is a very simple galvanic cell. Here is the extension of our um, acronym from before. So we've got an oil rig cat. So, and the other thing you can add is a happy cat to that. 
So when we're looking at galvanic cells, essentially what we're doing is we're doing an indirect reaction. I keep doing that. Um, discard. Apologies, I don't know why I keep doing that. We have an indirect reaction. And by having that indirect reaction, we're going from chemical to electrical, which is what we prefer. We don't want to go from chemical to, um, to thermal. So as you can see here, this is direct, this is indirect. So, cool. Moving on. Um, the other thing I would just briefly talk about is your electrochemical series. Um, electrochemical series is really, really important. Make sure you know how to utilize it. Make sure you know where the strongest oxidant, the weakest oxidant, the strongest reductant, the weakest reductant, and which way the strengths go. Um, and it's really important to remember that you're always going to work with the strongest oxidant and the strongest reductant. You're never going to work with the weaker ones. You're always going to work with the strongest oxidant and the strongest reductant. So um, we've seen the following reaction will be able um, to be used in a galvanic cell to generate electrical energy. We've already discussed that. But what if we replace the Cu2 plus with Mg2 plus? Would we still be able to generate electricity? Well, the simple answer to this is no. Um, and that is because of the electrochemical series. So let's have a quick look. What do we have? We had, what we had was this, 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 and this. And then what we changed to was still this, still this, this, and this. Um, and what we wanted, well, specifically what we changed is we put the Mg2 plus and we said, hey, what if we actually said, what if we put the Mg2 plus on this side? Is this actually going to work? What if we did it like this? Well, that's not going to work because that's top left, bottom right. That doesn't work. The only way this would work is if it went this way. That is the only way that would work. So in this case here, by putting it like that, that equation there is not going to be an electrolytic equation. It's not going to work. So as you can see here, that works. Cool. Spontaneous. Now, what if I did this? It's not spontaneous because it's bottom left, top right. That is electrolysis. That would have to be forced. This is not that. We're looking at spontaneous versus non-spontaneous right now. So if the oxidant on the left-hand side is above the reductor on the right-hand side, the reaction will spontaneously occur. So what if we have multiple reactions? I, whoops, let's, you know what, let's fix, fix that very quickly. This guard. Let's fix that very quickly. I apologize, I did not mean to. Oh, and then I've done that. And then we've done that. We're gonna fix this very quickly in front of all your eyes. None of you saw this. Look at that quick fix. I think it looks like that. It'll do. I apologize, sometimes I forget to edit through my slides. So, as you can see here, I fixed up this slide very quickly. What if there are multiple reactions possible? We have to preferentially pick out our oxidant and our reductant. So if we add Cu solid and we add Pb solid to an Ag plus solution, what are we going to choose? We're always going to choose our, choose our strongest. What produces our greatest voltage? What is our greatest voltage difference or our potential difference? That is what we're going to work with. So we're always going to choose our highest on the left, lowest on the right. That is always going to happen. And that is the same for electrolysis as well. It doesn't change. So the next thing that I just want to quickly talk about, and I'm going to talk about it through me, is the SLC of the E0 series. So we all know SLC. SLC is equal to 25 degrees Celsius or 298 Kelvin. It's equal to one molar and it's equal to 100 kilopascals, which technically here would be 0 0.997 or 987, whatever value that is, that is the um, way that we change it. Um, essentially here, these are our SLC conditions. This E0 table was created using our hydrogen. So it was created using the this one here, our hydrogen equation, and comparing it with all these other half cells. So we took this half cell and we compared it with every single other half cell. And we created a table. And we created this exact table. But it was a scientific experiment. So thinking a little bit about um, clinical application, thinking a little bit about um, 
our, what do we call it, experimental design. So thinking about our experimental design, everyone, what is really, really important about experimental design is our constant factors or our controlled variables. So controlled variables, SLC. We kept everything at 25 degrees. We kept all of the aqueous solutions at one molar. We kept all the gaseous solutions at 100 kilopascals. Or gaseous solutions, gaseous concentrations, whatever they are. 100 kilopascals. We kept the pressure at 100 kilopascals. So this entire equation here, this entire table here was created at SLC. So when you're not at SLC, what happens? You can't use the table. Now, chemistry is a bit weird. Sometimes you'll find that, like, things will be slightly off SLC, but you just don't, you just ignore it. There will only be times where they'll make it really, really obvious, and then you'll need to discuss this, but it doesn't come up all that often. So, just really important just to note that the E and naught series is at SLC. So, if you're not at SLC, it shouldn't work, slash you shouldn't be using the E and naught series because things are not going to be right. So, that's a really important factor. So, the next thing as well is just knowing your equation to get your potential difference. So when we talk about our voltage, we talk about potential difference. Really important. This equation here uses oxidant first and the reductant second. Remember which side are our oxidants and which side are our reductants. Our oxidants are on the left and our reductants are on the right. So you're going to do your top equation, take away your bottom equation. Um, for those of you who are very switched on to your maths, you will realize by that that you will always, always, always get a positive answer. Even if you're working with two negatives, so if you're working with like negative 14, negative 0.14, sorry, and then you were working with this one here, you would go take away 0 0.040. By doing that, you're actually going to be end up doing the equation negative 0 0.14 plus 0 0.40. You're going to end up with positive 0 0.26. So you are always going to get a positive answer here, no matter what. You are never going to get a negative answer on this on this equation. If you get a negative answer, you've done something wrong, you need to go back and have another go at it. Um, so really important, you should always, 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 always get a positive answer here. If you don't get a positive answer, something's wrong, go back and start again. Um, you need to go back to it. So really important, you should always get a positive answer. So then very quickly, fuel cells. I'm not going to go into too much detail on fuel cells just because um, there's a few ones that you probably should just know pretty quickly. Um, but essentially with fuel cells, the biggest difference is you need to have constant supply of fuel. Um, and they're a very cool piece of technology. They're very high tech in a way. They're not really high tech, but they are high tech. They're high tech in the sense that they're not commonly used. One, because they're um, expensive to maintain when there is an issue. Um, and two, they need a constant supply of fuel. Um, so you never run out. You're always going to be running this thing. Um, and essentially, fuel cells are a galvanic sort of cell. They're never really, they're never secondary because your products that are produced will always disappear. So they're never really secondary. They're always a primary um, and they act a lot like a galvanic cell. They are a galvanic cell. So the common example they'd love to give is hydrogen. So this is a hydrogen fuel cell. So I love to use the example like this one here. So essentially what you've got is you've got hydrogen. Stop doing that. I don't know why when I put my arm down, like on the iPad with your arm down, it's not meant to do anything because you've got the pen. So every time I put my arm down, it cracks it and tries to get out of it. Nonetheless, you've got your fuel going in, and as your fuel goes in, it goes into your porous electrode. So this is your porous electrode, and it has little holes in it. And essentially, what's going to happen is the uh, hydrogen goes into these little holes. And as the hydrogen goes into these little holes, essentially what happens is it hits the sort of the catalyst and the, the electrolyte membrane you have here. So this is an electrolyte membrane. And essentially what happens is it goes through redox. And out come the electrons, the electrons come out, and they go through the external circuit, and in goes our H pluses. So it breaks up into H pluses, which we refer to as a proton. And our H pluses move across the electrolyte to the other side. And this electrolyte is like the barrier to it. And as it moves across, it binds back up with these electrons that have gone through the circuit and it joins in with oxygen or an individual oxygen atom because it breaks up and it forms water, out comes water. Now there's a little bit of heat as a byproduct on these. 
um, but don't worry too much about that, you just get a little bit of heat. Essentially what the big deal here is the idea that this is a fuel cell and you have a constant supply. You're always supplying these hydrogen. If there's any hydrogens that don't get used, they get recycled and pushed back through. And what we use is air on the other side. We just use oxygen. So we just have air go in and out goes excess air that wasn't used and out goes some water vapor because you have H2Os produced. And so that is what is going on there. So fuel cells don't store reactants or products. They continuously get supplied and exhaust them. So as we can see, the fuel cell is pretty much the same as a galvanic cell, except we've got a continuous supply of reactants. Um, this is the main difference between other galvanic cells and fuel cells. Um, and if on an exam you're asked for the difference, this is the one that you should always, 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 always go to. Always go to the continuous supply of reactants first. So, however, there are a few other subtle differences, including properties of the electrodes, operating temperatures, role of electrolyte, etc. Move on. So, the other fuel cell that you're gonna see a lot um, is the DMFC, which works with methanol. Um, so this here is methanol. This is a really common one that's used. Um, when we work with methanol, you'll s there's one other thing that I wanna just quickly talk about. What you'll see is that we have a delta H for methanol. You can go to the data book and get that. Essentially, the same amount of energy released per mole, regardless of whether we use the fuel cell or directly combust, what's the point in using the fuel cell? So you're going to get the same amount of energy, so the same delta H if I combust it or if I use a fuel cell. Well, let's talk about energy transfer transformation. The DMFC, which uses methanol, is very direct and straightforward. So it goes chemical energy to electrical energy. If I actually combust, the generator has lots of steps. It goes chemical energy to heat energy first, which you know heats up a piston, and then you get the piston running, which is the mechanical energy, and then that piston causes electrical energy to be formed. At each step, we lose a vast proportion of our energy, and this goes out as wasted heat. So thus, fuel cells are significantly more efficient. Think about it, if this as being this step here, it's usually around 40 to 60% efficient. That's around 40 to 60% efficiency. This step here is also around 40 to 60% efficiency. But then so is this, let's just say this is 50, and then this is also 50. And what you do with these is you multiply them together. So let's say for the sake of it, they're all 50. 50. 50, 50. I need to multiply all these together. For this one, it's 50, and there's nothing to multiply about. So this is 50% efficient. The amount of energy that there is, 50% of it ends up as electrical energy. Here, from chemical to heat energy, 50% of it becomes heat energy. So the same efficiency as above. But then, I need to go from heat to mechanical, and 50% of the energy that was heat energy goes to mechanical. So overall, I'm now at actually 25%. Then, 50% of what was mechanical energy goes to electrical. So again, I was at 25%, I'm now at 12.5%. So that is why we say, and you'll hear a lot of people refer to it, and some textbooks refer to it, as fuel cells being 100% efficient. They're not 100% efficient, but they are the most efficient way of converting chemical energy to electrical energy that we have. It is 100% of our potential. It is the best we have, so a lot of people will refer to it as 100% because people will, a lot of people say that is as much as we will ever get. So that is 100% of what we're going to get. The rest of it is just always, that's just what it is. It's what the world we live in. But in actual fact, it's around 40 to 60% because we still, we still theorize that we're one day going to be able to get 100% of that chemical energy out into electrical energy. For now, we work at about 40 to 60% of the fuel cell. For as you can see, a generator there, they run, they do run at around 20%. It's somewhere from 10 to 20% for most generators. And same with cars. Cars run at about 20%. Our coal mines run at about 25%. It's terrible, but it's the reality of what we work with and it's the best we have that works. For our fuel cells, there are reasons why we don't do them. As much as they are 50%, you think it's so much better. There are reasons. And some of those reasons come down to the cost of them. They're really expensive. They're really are a bit of a complex piece of machinery that when something does happen to them, they're really expensive to fix um, and complex to fix. Um, they're generally quite um, 
easy to maintain in terms of nothing usually happens to them. They usually they just do their thing and you never really have issues. But if you do then do come across an issue, which is rare, but if you do, it's a really big issue and they're quite hard to fix. Um, and they're just, they're not that practical. They're a big piece of machinery that you need a constant supply. And when you stop supplying them, they lose their efficiency. So you need to keep supplying them and it's just, it's just not theoretical. It's, not, it's just not realistic. It's not going to work. Um, so they are just some of the things about fuel cells. And as you can see here, this is what we discuss in terms of efficiency. So as you can see, this is just to summarize some things about fuel cells. Amazing. Let's move into electro, electrolytic cells. So electrolytic cells are the reverse of galvanic cells. It's where we go backwards. So that's non-spontaneous reactions that are driven forward by input of energy. So we put a battery in and we force it to go backwards. So electrodes are inserted directly into the electrolyte and current is passed through and we go from electrical energy to chemical energy. So we're recharging. It's like how you, those batteries that you use them and you stick them back into the wall and they recharge and then you can stick them back into wherever you want them. So that is essentially what is going on there. We are using that chemical energy. Then when it's all up, we put it back into the power socket in the wall and we force it back into chemical energy. We force the electrical energy back into chemical energy. Then we can reuse it. It's the same thing with your phone. So as you can see here, the cathode and the anode stay the same. They're always going to be reduction and they're always going to be oxidation. The flow of electrons is the same. What changes is the polarity. The cathode becomes negative, the anode becomes positive. The negative electrode is where electrons are now gained rather than where electrons are now lost because it, the negative electrode is now the cathode. You don't have a salt bridge. Um, you don't necessarily need one and I'll explain a bit. The separation of um, reactants doesn't, isn't also necessary anymore. And we'll discuss that in a little bit. So the electrolyte will contain several redox active species. So the strongest oxidant is reduced at the cathode. The strongest reduction is oxidized at the anode as per usual. Molten electrolytes um, uh, make it a lot simpler to figure out what's going on. Because what's going to happen now when we talk about electrolytic cells is we look at things that are aqueous and we look at water. So we look at hay. If I've got an aqueous solution, I'm actually going to have water in there. And what's going to happen if I force it backwards, but I've got water in there? Well, water might be the thing that reacts. Because let's just say, for the sake of it, you've got this, you've got this, and you have this. These two are going to react. Now, what if I actually didn't have that, and I had this, and I had this? Well these ones are gonna react. And in this case here, that's spontaneous. Now, what if I had this, this, and this? Well, these are gonna react spontaneously. Actually, I probably shouldn't use that one. I'll use the top one just to make it, I'll use this one and this one. So that one's gonna be forced because that is highest on the left and lowest on the right. Now, what if I didn't have that and I actually had this down here? Well, this is now highest on the right on the left, sorry. So this one is going to react with that one, which is lowest on the right. So we're actually going to get water react. So in that case, we need the magnesium um, to be molten. So we need it to be really high temperature so it doesn't have any water in there. So that is what we talk about with molten, elect uh, molten electrolytes. Um, remember to consider H2O in case of an aqueous electrolyte. So what reacts preferentially? It's probably the hardest part. Um, so... They always go to the highest bidder. So again, it's the same thing. Even though it's not spontaneous, we still work with the strongest oxidant and the strongest reductant. And that's really important. It can be quite confusing with electrolysis because you have all these new rules thrown in there and you'll be like, but what's going on? Always revert back to that basic rule. Strongest oxidant, strongest reductant. That never changes ever, ever, ever. That always stays the same. So please make sure you keep that the same. Um, in a more specific sense, in a more scientific sense, if you have a stronger oxidant and a stronger reductant, they're going to do more work on their own and thus you have to put in less energy. Um, it all just happens more easily. Um, if you have weaker ones, you need to put more energy in for them to do the work. Um, but the stronger the ones you have, the better it's going to work. So let's just have a quick look at, as we were discussing that molten versus um, non-molten. So we have here a molten one. So how do I know this is molten? Because this is a liquid. When it's a liquid, it's pure. So this is molten. 
this is a molten um, solution. So, what species are present? I have Na plus and I have Cl minus. What is the strongest oxidant? Na plus. What is the strongest reduction? Cl minus. What reaction is going to occur? The reaction is going to be these two here. So, NLCl uh, aqueous. What is present? Well, what is present is Na plus, Cl minus, and H2O. Now, I think this should have been done in a different color, so I'm going to purposely do these all in a different color. I have all three of these now. Actually, I don't need to do them in a different color because they're all just going to be that. Don't worry. I have all three of them. Which is the strongest oxidant? The strongest oxygen is H2O because going up, that's my strongest oxidant. Which is my strongest reductant? Coming down, that's going to be my strongest reductant. So what's going to react? Water is preferentially going to be reduced and oxidized. So what's going to happen? Nothing. I'm going to go from water to water. Nothing's going to happen. It's completely useless. So really important. Well, actually, it's not going to go water to water. It's going to go water to H2 gas um, and O2 gas, actually, um, because remember, this one flips. Um, but you're going to have water reacting with water to get O2 gas and H2 gas, which is not what we want. We don't want that. We want to split it back into Cl2 gas and we want to split our Na plus into Na solid. So really important here to understand that that is what's going to happen. Um, we're going to have waters preferentially react. So here's um, a really good practice question with this. So we have a direct electrical, a direct electric current is passed through one molar K2SO4 solution using inert electrodes. The following standard redu uh, reduction potential is provided in addition to those in the data book. So you can see where this would, would be added. 2.1, it's gonna go up in here. Which of the following reactions represents the, rea uh, represents the reaction that occurs at the anode? So those of you who are at home, pause it, have a go. Those of you watching the premiere, you can have a quick think about it, but we're gonna go through it straight away. So again, I do apologize, I forgot to change that. Um, if I look at this here, I have one molar. What's that tell me? I'm working with aqueous. What does that tell me again? I have water equations. So I'm going to write this one in very quickly. I'm just going to write um, S2O8 to negative. I'm not going to write the thing. I'm just going to write SO4 to negative. So what do I have? I have that. I have this. Um, really important. I'm actually not going to circle that one because I'm not going to get peroxide. It's not going to work. Um, this is a bit of a, that's why you don't generally use that one. I'm actually going to circle this one. And then on the other end of things, um, I have this here. And what is, which is the final equation occur, uh, represent what occurs at the anode? Well, this is the strongest oxidant, no, the strongest reductant, sorry. So this one's going to get flipped and become um, oxidation and it's going to become what's at the anode. So what's actually going to happen is H2O liquid to O2 gas plus 4H plus plus 4E minus. Is that one of my answers? It is. It's B. So I have my answer straight away. I've straight away figured out my answer is B because as you can see, I had water, I had aqueous solution. So that is why in this case here, you'd need this to be molten for it to work. So this is another really good example of how these ones work. Again, this one here, um, I'm not gonna have time to go through it. So I'm just gonna leave it for now and not go over it. However, for those of you who are watching the recording um, and those of you in the premiere, you can quickly just mute. Um, the answer here is, Two, one, the answer here is B. So if you did want to have a go at this one, please have a go at that um, afterwards and your answer there is B. So there are just quickly two basic types of cells. We've talked about primary, they're non-rechargeable, secondary or rechargeable. These are electrolytic cells. These are electrolytic. Um, these are disposable, these are reusable. So think about it in terms of like, it's kind of like fuels, reusable versus non-reusable, all that sort of stuff. Um, so what's really, really important is that when we go from chemical energy to electrical energy, we refer to it as galvanic. And when we go from electrical energy to chemical energy, we refer to it as electrolytic. That means all secondary cells have a galvanic component. So if you are asked what has a galvanic cell in it, a secondary cell does. Even though we say like, oh, galvanic cells are really just those that, you know, 
they're just those that go through discharge and then they shouldn't really go through secondary. Well, they're actually not. Galvanic cells are an aspect of secondary cells because that discharging component is referred to as galvanic. And then the recharging component is referred to as electrolytic. So really important, if you get a secondary cell, it does have a galvanic component to it. Um, and that was a question in the past. I think it was like 2016 or 2017. Um, there was a question, a multiple choice question on that. Um, and most people got it wrong because they thought, ah, oh, secondary cell, it's not going to have a galvanic component, but it did have a galvanic component. So secondary cells are rechargeable um, and that can be driven um, forwards like a galvanic cell. Now, one thing I just really want to put out there, um, actually, no, I'll do it in the next slide because I just thought next slide. Um, requirements for being a secondary cell is that the reaction must be reversible and the really important point is the products of discharge must remain in contact with the electrode. So if you produce a gas whilst going through discharge, you're not going to be reversible because that gas is just going to go off. It's not going to stay in contact with the electrode, it's going to disappear. It needs to stay in contact with the electrode to be reversible. Really important. Um, the polarity of the electrodes will never change it's just the anode and cathode swap. So that's really important. Now, what I was trying to point out here is it's a little bit of a physics point, but it very rarely happens, but you may be asked to write out a secondary cell. Very rarely, but it may happen. Um, so you've got an anode, you've got a cathode. This is discharge. You've got the cathode positive, you've got the anode negative. We know that this is gonna stay positive. This is gonna stay negative and I'll well, put circles around it so it doesn't confuse it. That's gonna stay positive, that's gonna stay negative. What's gonna flip is this is gonna become the anode and this is gonna become, ooh, I did not mean to do that. This is going to become the cathode. That's what we know. That's what we know is going on when we do it. That means the electron flow is also gonna flip. The electron flow is gonna go that way and both these equations are gonna flip. So when I put the battery in, how am I going to put the battery in? Which way am I going to put it? So when you draw a battery in, it looks a bit like this. You draw out a little battery and you put a positive at one end and a negative at the other. Which way am I going to put it? Well, I'm just going to tell you now to simplify it out. The positive end of the battery goes to the positive side and the negative end of the battery goes to the negative side. So positive here, negative there. And it will always work like that. You always put the positive side of the battery to the positive side and the negative side of the battery to the negative side. Same thing with like the salt bridge with the cations and the anions and going to the near correct side and how the cations will go to the positive side and then anions will go to the negative side. Same thing with the battery here. Negatives to negatives and positives to positives. They sort of similar things match. So getting rid of all this, this is our discharging cell now. So going back to the normal, this is our discharging. And as I said, positive will stay on the right side. It will stay on the well, the right side here, the anode will, or the negative side will stay negative and the anode and cathode will flip. As you can see, it flips. The electron flow flips, the external circuit, the positive was on the positive side and the negative was on the negative side. And they are the really important aspects to get your head around if you are ever asked to draw out a secondary cell. It very rarely happens, but I have had students in the past asked in a SAC um, or in some sort of test or assessment that have been asked to draw one out. So really important, keep the positive and the negative. You may also be asked in an exam, you may be given a diagram like, like this and they say, all right, pick out which side is the positive side and which one is the negative. Well, as soon as you see this battery like this, you know this is the positive side and this is the anode during recharge. You know this is the negative side and this is the cathode. You know, you know this stuff. As soon as you see this stuff, it's like buzzwordy, it's like, Bang, in my brain, I know that is the anode. I know that is the cathode. I know that is positive. I know that is negative straight away. So they're just little tips and tricks to get you through what can be a really, really challenging topic. Now, there's one more practice question, but again, we are sort of out of time. Um, again, for those of you who want to go through this question yourself, please pause and go through it or mute yourself right now. Because Mute it right now because I'm going to read out the question. I'm going to read out the answer in two, one. The answer here is A, um, so please have feel free to have a go at that later on. Um, but yes, essentially, that's everything for today. So hopefully that covered everything that you wanted. If you have any other quick questions, I'm in the chat. Um, hopefully I've answered all your questions throughout and hopefully there's no more questions. Um, just a special thanks quickly to La Trobe University, RMIT, Deakin, UTS, and Macquarie University. These are all people who have been sponsoring us to allow these to get out to you for free. 
um, and allow you guys to all learn about chemistry um, in this class here. So essentially, um, check out all the stuff that we've got down in the in the uh, the portal there. Check out all sort of the resources we have, the slides, all of our promos and things like that. Please, we will have some lectures throughout this series on sort of these universities doing some promos. Please check them out as well. Um, I'm sure you're all thinking about uni or whatever is next in your life. So please consider these things. Otherwise, good luck for the rest of the year. I'll probably see you around. I generally run these lectures. Um, and yeah, good luck. Hope you enjoyed.